La Grande Bellezza, or The Great Beauty, is a 2013 Italian movie written and directed by Paolo Sorrentino, who I know from Il Divo and Young Pope, which I both enjoyed, so I was really excited to see this. It stars Tony Savillo as our lead again, as Jep Gambardella, and how he journeys through his nightlife and Rome itself. Alongside him is Carlo Verdone, Sabrina Farilli, and Carlo Bucciroso, though I only know the latter from Il Divo, but I believe the rest are quite famous in Italy. It's a dreamlike odyssey of Jep's search for happiness and beauty, but as he puts it, he is the king of the mundane, and he becomes increasingly disillusioned with his life of mingling with the high society of Rome and meeting the various characters within it. Destinato a diventare uno scrittore. Ero destinato a diventare Jepp Gambardella. I really loved it. The witty but cutting dialogue, the bizarre characters and the strange juxtaposing of decadence and superficial beauty meets the real beauty and deeper history of Rome itself. The old meets new and occasional glimpses of a more darker, unattractive underbelly. That's why I find it so hard to discuss the story, there's so many scenes and characters going on. A better overview might be that Jep is, as we've discussed, is mundane, he feels unhappy with life. But he's a writer, yet he's only ever written one book, and he passes the time writing articles for a newspaper that clearly don't satisfy him. He's been suffering from this creative block for decades, and it seems linked to his first and potentially only love, Yet even that doesn't do the film justice. So let's give some key points. Uh, at one point, Jep strikes up an innocent friendship with a lady called Ramona. He also meets the husband of his former first love, who informs Jep of her passing and how she maybe still loved him through a diary he read. And then also there's a chance encounter with a saint that helps Jep reflect. However, that really doesn't do it justice still. I've tried to avoid spoilers, but just to give some example, there's a priest who loves cooking more than he loves God. There's the I screw you man when he gets drunk. There's the lady with the communist vagina running into walls. The kid who just wants to be a kid, but is forced to paint for the high society. Jep's best friend who's mistreated by a girl. And it goes on. But wait, there's even more! We still haven't done it justice! Did I mention the CGI giraffe, or the CGI flamingos, or the man with the keys to Rome, or the nobles for hire, or the princesses, or Jep's weird neighbour, or the professor? Sometimes it's so easy to get lost in what exactly does Jep want, what even is going on right now, and you can find that it is moving at quite a fast pace, Personally, it didn't mind me so much, it kind of worked with that dreamlike suggestion I had you're going through this hazy fog of memories. I'd probably compare it to Fellini's Satyricon, or perhaps the Divine Comedy. I'd actually lean to the Divine Comedy for some of the more scathing interpretations of Rome and the high society. Rome. However, it's difficult to know whether this film is in love with the high society or against them. There's a sort of pretentiousness that the film itself is both repulsed and smitten by. You can't tell if it's saying these high art is vapid or worth its weight in gold. And I hope that I've built up a good picture of just how weird and wonderful this film is. It's very beautiful, almost like that's why it's called The Great Beauty. There were a few wide shots, they seemingly were more Rome itself and the beauty there. Uh, there was a lot of use of lighting, a lot of darker corridors of things unlit, especially the parts of Rome or artwork that were sort of hidden to the public. There was this mysterious shadowy feel to it and anything more underground or as I mentioned that darker underbelly definitely was swamped in this shadowy arena. Now for the majority of it it's more character shots, close-ups, relied on the dialogue and the moving forward. I will say it seemed like they really played around with the shots like where would they position Jet? where would they put him 
and it almost created an atmosphere of some shots felt really pretentious. His lazing on the couch and gazing at the ceiling that's now the ocean. However, because of the style of the film and the aforementioned is the film repulsed or smitten by it, it, it completely works for it. You don't watch it and go, oh, this is another up itself art film. No, it, it definitely isn't, and these all definitely really carry it forward. One scene in particular, a uh, lady is snorting coke in the kitchen and all the dishes are piled high and it's all dirty and the servants who we don't really see much of are there as well, sort of silently judging as they move by. I liked it. I felt that even that scene looked like it had been handcrafted, like each plate had been antagonised over until it was perfect, which kind of, again, really built into this scene. One scene to mention most of all is the opening scene. Not to disparage the rest of the movie, but the opening scene really set the tone. This crazy fast-paced party full of noise and hedonism is immediately hit into the background dancer, who you see dancing all alongside this, but when it cuts into her white room, the sound is silent. She's not got any noise or music. You feel completely isolated from the party. You feel as though you're an observer on other people's happiness and it immediately sinks us into Jep's character as this is his birthday party. This is who we are with. And as the scene progresses, sort of when it's quieter and not partying, for example, the end of it, the people walking away or the talks in the bathrooms, None of that is beautiful and it really adds to that superficial beauty and how this film is going to go. There's so much content I could go on scene by scene. For example, the child painting, you've got the observers gazing upon her, her anger and near tears as she's spreading it over the close-ups, the colours. It's all so vibrant, but we can move to a more darker shot, the more gloomy, hidden, historical Rome. And it's just all so crafted so well, it's near perfect. So I'd say just lose yourself grimacing at the bittersweet scenes or the joyous rapture or feeling melancholy at the more introspective and reflective parts, regardless of how you feel about the pretentiousness or the high society. One strange thing is that during fade in and fade outs and cutting out of black, it's generally a woman screaming into the camera. Not too sure what that's about, I didn't read more into it, Maybe it's his love trying to scream out, but anyway, it's kind of amusing throughout the film. Mom, quando ti vedo arrossisco. This is where the film shines and certainly gets you gripped. Yes, the scenes might be juicy and interesting, but the strange and wonderful characters we get to meet, almost a plethora of them, is what keeps you watching and keeps you hooked, especially when you see reappearances or the subtle changes in their lives, and it just keeps you enjoying it and learning more. Lui For example, the angry kid painting. She just wants to hang with her friends, but her parents make her do the painting. The High Art Society sees her as some prodigy or child genius, but she clearly just wants to be a child. But they value the art as being worth something, so is her suffering worth it? There's, there's so much to delve into there. There's so many little ideas. And before you can really grasp it, and get a bearing sound, you've jumped to the next scene, the next challenge. And I quite enjoyed that. I mean, just to give a few more examples, Carlo Butcherosso as the I Screw You Man, who on sober or quieter occasions, he's very loving to his wife and almost in love with her, but he's similar age, older, but out on the parties, the dance floor, every new woman, as he walks past them, he'll say, I screw you and I can't help but take that as perhaps love of Rome's old, but actually they'll screw the hell out of anything new and go from there. It's the same with the priest, you could jump into that thing. The priest cares about cooking more than God, and you could say that's a reflection of Rome and Italy itself. Uh, I, again, I don't know if it's a scathing interpretation of Rome or it's a love letter, but each character sort of builds upon that. 
The dialogue is really well written, really crisp, and that's what really complements it. No matter how ludicrous the character is or the crazy things they say, it seems real. It feels almost like you can believe that these people exist and that maybe you've met them or met parts of them, and it keeps building and building. I've mentioned Carlo B, but Sabrina Farilli as Ramona is also fantastic. She's a stripper at a gentleman's club and makes the friendship with Jep and he starts taking her to high society. And she almost seemingly doesn't fit in, but kind of does. And she's just phenomenal in it. All of them are, no matter how minor the character role is, from Jep's editor all the way to Jep himself, Everyone gives it their all. It's like they've sat and worked out the cast really well. I will say Paolo Sorrentino has worked with several people before, so perhaps it's just a case of building a rapport like that that really builds it. But I just loved it. I just loved that every new crazy character we met, one I haven't mentioned is the Saint's Handler, this slightly more flamboyant, crazy, fast-talking camp man. He's really good, and he says stuff like, the saint only eats roots. The saint only does this. And he says it really fast and really quickly. And he seems so caricature, but you can't help just believe that this man does exist. So really, I loved it. The casting characters is really what sold me. I'm not disparaging anything else of the film, but this was the big one. And it just helps transfix you into this world and that it becomes a world. It's not just set pieces and characters that we're moving through. We are moving through a living, breathing world. Whoa. There's very little effects to talk about. There's none really, except a couple of CGI. CGI giraffe and a CGI flamingo. It's very obvious it's not very well done. Perhaps the budget was running out. But it doesn't affect the movie. It doesn't affect it at all. You can even chalk it up to my dreamlike suggestion. There's no reason to knock the film down for this. In fact, it's almost cheeky with it, and I kind of hated it, but really loved the sort of audacity about it, and I will spoil this a little bit. There's a joke in the film where Jep is walking and he sees this giraffe and wonders how it gets there, and the magician appears and says, oh, I'm doing a trick, I'm going to make it disappear. And Jep turns around to talk to someone else, and when he turns back, oh, the giraffe isn't there, and the magician goes, See? It's magic. And it's so obviously CGI that was it a design choice or was it budget running out? That's all I'll mention. I just thought it was very amusing. Fortunately, I'm always the least qualified person to talk about sound, but I thought it was pretty emotive. I really liked it. I can't say that any piece stood out to me, but the classical side was really good. You know, the big instrumental, the bigger pieces alongside Rome's history. That was a great atmosphere. It does also, in the parties, have party songs, I guess some old Euro trash, I don't know. Obviously that's combined with the more classical music, the old meets new, the themes running forward. Bye. The beginning of the film is a quote. Which is from Journey to the End of the Night, uh, a slightly surreal strange book about a man's grotesque walk through life itself and you can see why it's applied to the film. We're sort of going through dreams, Fogg's walking through his life as he tries to seek what he wants. Now I do think that works, there is that kind of haziness to it that even yourself you'll experience as you're watching you go, oh I remember him, or oh yeah he was from that bit, or oh that's the person that's been mentioned here five times, or Oh, that guy! And you, you constantly have it like that, in the same way Jet is walking down the streets and bumping into old friends, you're bumping into the old characters, even though you've only been watching it for two hours and a half. So the main theme is the fake versus real, the superficial versus the pure. That, that's the main theme, the old versus the new, and I don't actually think it goes too much deeper than that. Perhaps you can analyse that out if you will. I, I'm not saying you can't, but I feel that it's always just looking at what's better, what's right. Should we have the old? Should we move to the new? What's going too far? Like, take the saint. Her handler is almost like a pop idol manager. Is that right? Is that how saints are now? Yeah, at the same time, she's still doing the work and the correct stuff of a saint. Can these two work together? 
I think it just keeps asking you these little questions in each scene and just keeps going from there. It never goes deeper and deeper into it. It just goes, oh, is this art? Is this proper art? Or is it this statue? Is this only right because it's been around 200 years? Is this friendship true love? Is Was this actually love? Is your first love the only... It, it never seemingly goes more than that, but it will keep you thinking. I will also then go forward, there is also a talk about art, and like that high society, the pretentiousness it's both repulsed and smitten by is, what is worth something? What has higher worth than something else? Why is the art by the child so good if she just wants to be a kid? It, it, is her suffering and pain worth it? Is their suffering and pain for the Botox worth it? The restaurants they go to, the things they take part in, it is, is it real and still right just because they give it value or is it only the older centuries later when we choose to give it value? How are things seen today versus now? There's a lot of touching on that. Again, still not quite deep, the sort of audacious and crazy scenes do take up more of that. I will say even Jep suffers from this, and as I said, I wanted to mention him now. He has more to do with love itself, and he seemingly is empty. He's not found what's right. And that that's, again, as I said, the repulsion of pretentiousness, or is it in love with it, the fake versus the real, and so on. He gets swept up in it, but his seems to be more devoted to love itself and enjoyment. Like, is he just the way he is due to the loss of his first love? He's never written again, he just feels empty. He says he's the king of the mundane, yet his entire life is far beyond the mundane. Yet, the man who was with his first love finds love in his Polish maid. And there's a very cute scene where he talks to her, talks to her and him, and says, so what are you going to do? And they sort of say, we're going to have a quiet night and a bottle of wine. And he finds that very sweet and almost that that's exciting. <laughs> almost as though he feels the entire high society is meaningless in comparison to just having love itself. It just keeps bringing it throughout it. You keep asking and guessing and wondering why he is the way he is. One last thing, this, there is this strange love letter to Rome that I have mentioned and I can never tell. It seemingly embraces Rome and loves her despite her imperfections and her darker underbelly. Perhaps she is the great beauty but like with Il Divo I can't tell with Sorrentino is he satirizing Italians and Rome or is he loving them I never really can tell <gasps> So overall, I really enjoyed it. All I'm doing now is rethinking scenes, remembering parts that I didn't remember before. It's popping into my head, this whole fake versus real, everything. And I think that's the impact the film wanted. It wants you, like the hazy memory, for you to keep pondering on it, for it to pop into your head. And it's absolutely done that justice. However, maybe you disagree. Maybe you think I'm talking absolute rubbish and that I bought into this pointless, pretentious art film and I read too deep into it and it's not interesting and completely boring. Well, that's fine, because after all, we are...